Okay, George Durkee back with uh, Columbia College Geography 61. Uh, this will be video four in our series uh, setting up a search incident map with ARC Pro. And I have a uh, vague hope that this will be the fourth and last. So as I said in the last video, uh, our workflow here is to define the search area. We've done that with the search boundary and then to create uh, segments that each team will be assigned to to search for the person. Uh, we've got the last known point as uh, uh, signaled by the spot signal that, uh, that he uh, uh, did when he got to his camp. And then we created uh, the three, the four segments here uh, using uh, the uh, autocomplete polygon tool and then buffering a line uh, out and, and linking that to the search segments. So that's real basic, but that's that's the workflow. Now just to further set the scene, because what I want you guys uh, also to know, in addition to being able to use uh, the tools, the editing tools in ArcGIS Pro, but to just get an idea of what goes into a search or a fire. So as part of the investigation, uh, we got a sad image of the area just immediately after the storm. And so this is uh, the middle fork of the Kings River. And uh, this is the approximate area that uh, we're looking at. So you can see it's pretty well covered in snow. Uh, this is just after uh, that storm that went through that he uh, most likely got caught in. And so once you have a rough idea of where the person is, you start calling in search teams. And as I said, uh, search in national parks uh, is exclusive jurisdiction. And so uh, rangers and other uh, park personnel uh, can go out. But in a search like this, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, it's going to ramp up to a whole lot of people. And so you start calling in uh, search and rescue teams from throughout the state. And as I've said, Elsewhere, these teams are organized and supervised by their local county sheriff. And that request is made through the California Office of Emergency Services. And then they uh, call up teams that are qualified. And that's the important part here. Uh, these teams are qualified for extreme weather and mountaineering. And for that, they, they train pretty extensively and actually receive qualifications for a whole bunch of different uh, uh, skills required. So here the teams are coming in and they're getting uh, briefed uh, before they're put on a helicopter and taken into the search area. Uh, they're giving, getting briefed on uh, uh, safety uh, around helicopter. So here the helicopter is landing right in the search zone and this is right near the lake where the spot uh, signal was given. So on the first day of the search, the helicopter spotted tracks from the air even before any search teams were in on the ground. And so uh, one of the teams followed up on those tracks and found them uh, leading, leading uh, up and over the little pass that was right near his camp and then uh, uh, across on the other side. And also fortunately there were uh, 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 the boot that were still preserved in the snow, uh, the boot tracks, which were consistent with uh, uh, this person's shoes. And there was no sign of anyone else in the area. So you can make certain assumptions. Now, the downside of this was that these tracks weren't followed up fully as, as quickly as they might have been. Uh, uh, the team just went up from his camp to the pass, but didn't continue following them. Uh, it was getting late and so they they couldn't uh, continue that day. And so this is now the third day since uh, the person was reported overdue. On the first day, you know, you just spent organizing and making sure the guy's in the area and then uh, start getting teams in once the weather lifts enough to do that. Uh, the first day by air, there were still uh, pretty high winds and it was hard to get teams in. And so these teams go out there uh, prepared to spend a couple of nights out there. Uh, otherwise, you're spending an awful lot of time, helicopter time, in and out. And for uh, remote wilderness searches, uh, you spend an awful lot of time getting teams in and out. You only have, uh, well, it depends on the search and your resources available, but you might get a, two or three helicopters available. But 
it, it just takes a long time to ferry people in and out. So you you want the teams to be prepared to spend the night, and it's uh, it's pretty gnarly out there. Uh, a little frost on the bags there, and uh, these guys aren't even using uh, tents, so they go pretty light. Also, it's cold. Uh, that's, why, that's why these guys are so highly paid, <laughs> which of course they're not. Uh, they're volunteers, and so uh, they're just doing this because uh, uh, it's actually kind of fun, but also because they're trying to find somebody uh, who's out. So in any event, uh, they're out looking for clues or ideally uh, the person who's overdue. And each clue that's found is radioed in with the coordinates and a description of uh, what it is. And when the teams come out of the field, uh, we interview them, uh, debrief them, and download their uh, GPS. And if everything goes smoothly, then uh, we've got their route right there for them to look at and to uh, uh, jog their memory of where they were, and they can describe uh, what they saw. And then in, in addition, uh, over on the Inyo, uh, other search teams are searching this area here, and uh, uh, we're combining maps so we can look at uh, everybody's data and share uh, day by day uh, the plans of, of what to do next. So this was a pretty big operation. I think we had at least three, maybe even four helicopters uh, at the same time, and probably 70 people out in the field uh, and to find. 70 folks that are uh, qualified for uh, uh, high altitude uh, search uh, and who are in shape to do it. Uh, with the numbers that big, you often get one or two people who just get altitude sickness. So you've got to be aware of uh, uh, your own team and uh, how they're feeling. You don't want to uh, get anybody else in trouble. So, so in addition, one of the things on, on your incident action plan is what to do if you need to uh, evacuate uh, somebody on your team. So you've got a direct contact uh, and you have a plan on, on where to take someone. Okay, well, let's just add two more clues uh, and uh, then let's just move on to uh, uh, showing you guys how to uh, put in the GPS tracks, uh, how to convert them uh, to lines, and we'll use uh, both the tools within ArcGIS Pro and an app that uh, I think works a little better than, than the tools in Pro. So let's do the uh, clues first. So I mentioned the tracks. So zoom in close to where the, uh, uh, the uh, last known point is. And let's just uh, get rid of the segments to make it a little clearer here zoom out. So we're just going to do a uh, clue for the tracks. So let's go into editing mode. Turn on editing. Oh, I already had it on. Okay, turn on editing. We're going to create a point and lock that into place. That often appears and disappears pretty quick. And so we're going to go into clues and we're going to call it a relevant clue. And we're going to put it up here on uh, the pass, even though we followed the tracks up to here and then actually followed them down and, and across. But let's just put the clue right here. And let's bring up the uh, attribute table. Call it relevant and we'll call tracks, tracks in snow. Let's clear the selection. And then also, uh, meanwhile, our investigators have been uh, following up. And here I'm holding down the C key. And they've called uh, the uh, people who have permits and have talked to as many people as they can. There weren't many people this time of year with permits, but there are a few. And so one guy coming out on the Doozy Trail uh, over Bishop Pass talked to the individual and made a pretty positive ID and gave us good information on uh, what he was wearing and where he intended to go. Uh, and, uh, and so that's another relevant clue. Uh, but it's, it's also our last known point. So let's uh, go back to create and uh, we'll make that a point last seen. And we'll put that uh, right down here on the, on the switchbacks. And attributes. 
right, so that's uh, that's uh, seen by hiker, and uh, we'll give that a date of a few days before. So I don't know. Let's just make it last week, and uh, the time. Uh, this is going to come up in our labeling in the near future, uh, but let's let's. Uh, Let's make this, uh, well, I just made it 8 a.m. That sounds good. And just hit the enter key. And because we've got labeling on, uh, it uh, automatically shows the label there. Let's clear it. And save your edits. And that's all we're going to do here. Uh, well, we'll turn on labels for clues, too. But uh, uh, let's not get too carried away here, even though a lot of... Uh, Clues were found, uh, boots and things like that, which were not relevant. Um, but uh, uh, on the whole, all we had were those tracks and the point last seen and the spot uh, signal. And interviewing the witness, uh, you know, the weather was closing in. It was starting to get gusty. And uh, he remembered the individual as pretty lightly dressed, uh, a windbreaker. He didn't remember a hat. Uh, you know, like a wool hat or balaclava. He had a baseball cap or something like that. And because we're zoomed in, you can see how uh, poorly I'd drawn the, uh, the perimeter uh, of our search area, but, you know, good enough for the moment. And one thing, uh, especially when you have tracks, and uh, this is why it's, it's useful to uh, uh, have actually a line tool for for tracks because then and this is something I did on the search is I interviewed the spotter on the helicopter and uh, uh, got where the tracks went and uh, as I think I told you guys they went right over to uh, this little uh, switchback on the trail uh, which is pretty unusual you've got to know the terrain to head right for that point um, so it, it indicated that the person was familiar with the terrain and uh, still moving pretty well uh, on, on those tracks. Uh, but again, just for time here, we won't draw in a, a line. Uh, and in the, in the symbology, you can actually draw in a line with an arrow pointing the direction of, uh, of travel, which is pretty useful to illustrate uh, uh, the, uh, the, the tracks. Okay, let's save our project. Let's get out of editing mode. And now we're going to import some GPS tracks from a couple of the search teams in the, in the field. So open up your catalog and lock that into place. And in the written instructions, uh, there's a link to a zipped GPS data file uh, and uh, the path of uh, where uh, you should uh, put it, and it should go into the incident data and into the uh, uh, our MOC fire because that's got the uh, the uh, setup uh, the folder structure that we want, and then the GIS data folders and incident data and GPS. So for those of you in the class uh, from Canvas. You go into the files, and then you find the the uh, Geography 61 Barrett SAR, and click on that. And then it's not going to open as a preview, but you go up here to download, and then you navigate to your C drive and the MOC fire and your JS data folders, incident data, GPS, and let's download it there. And uh, if people are using a GPS, a dedicated GPS device instead of their phone, uh, some GPSs have a proprietary uh, uh, file type, uh, and you might have to convert those. And one thing we do on SARS is 
everybody's got a different cable to connect it to a computer. And, uh, you know, I, I'll show up with a huge bunch of cables that you kind of hope connects to anything people show up with. Now, ideally, everybody's using phones nowadays. And assuming you have a data connection, a phone connection, they can just email it to you. And, and that works pretty well. And there's some good uh, GP, GPS apps out there you can put on a phone. And I'll list a couple in the uh, written uh, uh, material. In any event, um, back to catalog, and you'll notice that the GPX don't show up in your catalog folder, and that's because they're not yet a uh, uh, SRE type file that it recognizes, and we're going to have to convert it using uh, a tool, a couple of tools actually. So let's next go to analysis, which is how we uh, access our tools uh, folders and bring up tools, lock it into place, and enter the search term GPX. And this will give you all the tools that are uh, uh, associated with uh, GPX. And so this is GPX to feature. So what that does is it converts a GPX GPS file uh, in the GPX format to a feature class. So bring that tool up, just click on it. It's pretty straightforward. You have an input and then you have an output feature class. So for your input file, uh, click on the folder here and let's navigate to uh, our 2021 MOOC fire and the fire data and then the incident data and then the GPS. And so now it shows up the GPX files. And uh, so let's start off with the October 21st uh, GPX file. Now, ideally, the file naming conventions will have the date and the team, and maybe even the name of the searcher. But the team is uh, uh, pretty important, and uh, actually included in the GPS folder is the file naming uh, convention that, that we prefer. Anyway, highlight that, go OK. And that uh, fills it in here. And in my case, it adds a two because I've already done this. So it automatically uh, gives it a different uh, file name. And then run. Now let's zoom out a little bit and find out uh, where that is. And it's uh, down here on the Muir Trail. Uh, so this is probably the second or third day of the search. And a team uh, went down. and. You can actually see where they went. Uh, they went all the way up to uh, what's called Mather Pass at 13,000 feet, uh, just clearing that whole trail to make sure he wasn't somewhere along there. Because the theory was, as the storm moved in, he might either have gone over that little pass and then dropped down to get out of the weather and down into the trees, or even uh, went down uh, either of these two drainages here, and both of those were searched as well. I'm only putting in just a little bit of a couple of the uh, GPS, GPX files so that you have practice uh, uh, importing them using the ARC tool. And now, of course, uh, these are as dots, and it's a little more helpful to have those as a line. And there's another uh, tool, which is points to track segments. So that'll turn it into a line. And so let's do that one. And so your input feature is going to be uh, the GPX uh, file we just put in. And then the date field uh, is the date time. And that's the only one available for that. And it, it uh, defines the file name already. And so it's points to track segments. And let's put, uh, in our case, JMT to show where that is. And uh, you can group them. Uh, and, and you can uh, include some other information here. But we won't have to do that. Those are optional. And let's just run. It takes a little while to run this one. Uh, and I'll show you why in a moment. OK, so it's assigned a uh, pretty wide yellow uh, line symbol, which uh, will change that right away. And uh, there'll be some other interesting stuff here uh, that, that I'll show you. So let's get rid of the completed box here. Go over. Let's change this into a line. And uh, uh, so 
in our symbology here, we have uh, several GPS type lines that we've standardized, helicopter, aircraft, or uh, GPS or hand-drawn, uh, which is important if you're debriefing people and either their GPS doesn't work or they uh, or didn't uh, or they don't have one. Uh, in fact, I was interviewing a team once, uh, not a regular SAR team, and <laughs> and I asked them if they had a GPS, and they said, "Yeah." And so I said, "Well, can I download the track?" Well, they didn't know to turn it on. So um, anyway, uh, sometimes you run into problems. Anyway, we're going to assign uh, the GPS track here. Now, here's a couple of uh, fun things. Um, notice we have these extra uh, lines in here. Um, and that's we're going to use the editing tools to, to get rid of those. Uh, but when you when you download a GPS, it connects a line according to the timestamp. So it'll connect a line um, from the last GPS GPX point and to the first one. So if you use it over a number of days, uh, what you end up with uh, uh, is these lines coming from all these other places the uh, search person has been. So he was on a search up towards uh, the north part of, uh, of uh, the uh, Sierra National Forest there. And uh, anyway, he's been all over. And so all of those places the person has been are now connected by lines. Uh, uh, which makes it more than a little confusing. And you always tell searchers to clear their GPS and so they can save their old tracks uh, and then to start a brand new session on their GPX. But uh, a lot of them just don't do it. And, and you also ask them to, so this is coming from the heliport at uh, Ash Mountain in Sequoia Park. And so then it just flies directly to um, to the search area, uh, and uh, uh, most of them also forget to not turn their GPS on and, until they get there. And actually, I'm sorry, the team did that. They didn't turn it on until they got there, but because they didn't clear their track, it, it connects from the last point and just gives you a straight line. Sometimes it's useful to have their flight in because uh, it, it, it shows that, assuming they're looking out the window and searching, it shows uh, uh, where you where they were on the route, and you can uh, uh, you can again not eliminate that, but know that it's been at least partially searched. So let's zoom in and clean this up a little bit. And uh, uh, GPS person fire or uh, search, uh, you're going to spend some time uh, cleaning uh, this sort of thing up. Just makes it easier uh, to uh, uh, to look at and and uh, show the terrain and show the search. So it's back to editing. We're on map. We go to edit. We turn on editing. And we select, we highlight the line. And uh, actually, that's already a separate uh, file there. So can, we can just delete that and get rid of it. Uh, but what you would use is the, uh, is the modify tool. And let's try and get rid of this part of the line. Let's zoom out. And so it's already actually done some segmenting for us. So we'll delete that. Holding down the C key, moving over, and we'll select this. And again, I'm not using the uh, the. Uh, and here's. Here's a straight line. My guess is here with no points in between and not following the trail. So my guess is here, the person was down below and, and essentially in the uh, uh, rain shadow or signal shadow. The, the satellite, the GPS satellite is a little bit low in the south. And so the, the ridge is blocking the signal. And so it's not getting any GPS signal. Uh, and, and, and so it's going a section there without it. And so anyway, I'm just going along here and uh, uh, getting rid of those straight lines. And again, just to clean it up. And here's another section that uh, didn't get uh, get any GPS. So that's that's what we want here. And and uh, I'll demo I'll demo once again uh, how to use the uh, 
uh, the split tool here. So you'd go to modify and uh, you'd go to split and you just draw a line. You, or I'm sorry, you highlight it and then draw a line across it and then it splits into into two there. Let's get the select tool again in there. And so I'm control Z uh, just to uh, put those two together again. Okay, let's zoom out and see what we have here. And holding the C key down. And that's pretty good. That shows their uh, their route there. And uh, a little, yeah, this is probably wrong, but we'll leave it in. It's unlikely they crossed the river. Uh, so that's probably a multi-path bounce there, but uh, uh, we'll leave it. I doubt they went up that high on the ridge, but you never know. And you'd want to interview the team and find out if, if they did in fact go up there. Okay, just to move things along, let's do that to one more. Let's save. And let's get out of editing. And let's go back to the analysis tool. And uh, enter GPX in the search box there. And so now we uh, do another GPX to feature. Navigate to the, uh, uh, let's do uh, uh, 2016 Team 17 tracks. Uh, points. And so this is correct. We know which team uh, did this, and we know it's a track file as opposed to a waypoint file. And so go OK. And again, it'll put us put it in our existing geo database, and give it the same name, uh, except it'll be GPX to feature. And let's run. And it completed successfully. So now let's click out of that and find out where it is. Ah, and it's a nice uh, track up here. Now you can also uh, right click and zoom to feature, but remember if we had done that with the last points here, it would have zoomed out to the whole half the state because uh, that's where the guy's tracks were. Uh, but here it's just local, so uh, that's, that's pretty good. And you can see this is pretty good coverage here. Uh, they were in uh, Doozy Basin and uh, covered covered the area pretty well. Now I'm going to save a little time here uh, on the uh, uh, point to track segment. I ran the point to track segment on these points here uh, to connect them together with with a line, and I got an error. And you know I spent some time trying to figure it out and never did figure out why uh, why it was glitching on me. So what I did is I used a program called DNR GPS, and it's it's pretty good. It's been around a very long time, and it converts pretty much any uh, GPX track, uh, whether it's proprietary or, or whatever, uh, and it'll convert it into points, and it'll convert it into uh, a shapefile specifically for ARC GIS. And so uh, I'm going to fire that up. I'm going to demo this to you guys uh, because it's a pretty good program, like I say. Uh, you don't have to use it because uh, the points there will be, be good enough. And so let's uh, go ahead and we'll import a file. We'll load from file. And again, it's going to be the same uh, uh, the same uh, folder path. And right now it's set to SHP. Uh, we don't want that. We want a GPX file. And we want the Team 17 uh, points. Again, it will be the same as these points here, same file. And so we open it up and it loads into uh, the, uh, uh, the app. And let's make it big here. And so this actually shows you the, the points. And I think the reason that it didn't uh, connect together by line is there's no timestamp here. It just shows the date, but, but no time. So now we're going to save uh, these points and into a line. And I think this saves them into a line uh, point to point because I think it just goes in order uh, that they're loaded there and it's not looking for an actual uh, uh, time field. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure of that. In any event, it works. So let's just go to uh, File, Save to File, and uh, 
let's uh, I don't already save it as a shape file. Let's just look at the GPX. So what we're going to do here is we're going to highlight the GPX, and that's just to give it the same name, uh, not necess but we're not saving it as a GPX. So let's just go ahead and go down to shape. And so that's uh, uh, what it's going to save as. We've got the name already in there. Uh, you could, of course, type it in, and I'm going to give it two because uh, I've already uh, saved it before, so I'm just going to give it a different number and then save. And now it gets, gives you the choice, so we can either save it as a point file, and it'll save all the same points we've already got, uh, or it'll save it as a line file, and that's what we want. And it goes pretty quickly, so there. Now usually uh, when we look in the catalog, we actually have to refresh it, so um, close it up and I'm right clicking and I go to refresh and uh, then now we've got the two files we've got the one I just did a little earlier and then we've got the one labeled two and so we add to the current map and notice how it uh, puts in a little line between all the points and so let's go to symbology and let's save that to the GPS and we can go ahead and close that and now let's save the whole project Okay, we're closing in on it here. Uh, let's do a little bit more housekeeping. I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a group layer. I'm going to call it GPS. And uh, this could also be uh, uh, both tracks and waypoints. And when the searchers are out, they're pinpointing any clues they find with a waypoint, which is a s just a single point. Uh, separate from the track file, and then you can uh, customize it by actually uh, putting a name in of uh, the clue you found. But you also want to keep a written log on a notebook as you're as you're searching. So now let's move all of our GPS points down to GPS. And so uh, they're all now in there. And we can get rid of the points and we'll just leave the lines. Now let's zoom out and see what we have here. Let's turn on our SAR segments. Okay, so there's essentially our search. Now, there's a lot more we could add in. Uh, I think I said this earlier. You can add in the uh, vehicle uh, out of the parking lot because that's a clue. And uh, uh, but again, we're, we're just showing the uh, the uh, overall search workflow uh, rather than uh, uh, you know doing a full uh, map search here. And incidentally, uh, Pro has another uh, pretty neat uh, tool here that you can use on a GPS track or anything with a timestamp on it, uh, a time slider, uh, where you can you can follow along at a uh, at a given rate, and it'll show you the uh, 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 how how the searchers were doing. Uh, we're not going to use that, so I'm just going to get it out of the way. Okay, let's label our clues here. Go down to clues and labeling, and turn on the label. And right now it's uh, labeled with the object ID, but we want it with the uh, we want it with a description of the clue. And so uh, notice this now is tracks and snow. So let's zoom out again. You know, let's, let's make this a little more uh, uh, transparent. So highlight segments and appearance. And let's, uh, let's even go up a little bit more. Yeah, 80% uh, or so. And let's uh, quickly fool around with some of our labeling here. So, uh, uh, so we're on segments. So let's uh, make that, right now it's regular, let's make that bold to distinguish it from, uh, uh, so that makes it a little clearer. And uh, now we get to the stage where uh, you've got endless uh, fiddling with the weighting of the labels so that they don't overlap and uh, uh, you give weight to uh, the ones you want to see. 
uh, might increase segments here. We've got it in bold. Let's, let's go up to 14 and see what happens. And notice we don't have our other segment here uh, shown. So uh, your choices here are to fool around with this endlessly uh, or as I did in fire mapping, uh, convert them either to graphics or annotations. And then you can click on each symbol or each label separately and uh, move it to where you want it. Uh, and, and you do that, as I said in that video, uh, by, by being uh, pretty close to the map you want and then uh, uh, moving them around. So let's try and at least bring in uh, the uh, buffered segment and I'll show you how to how to do that uh, but again it's kind of so you go over here to your uh, position strategy and uh, you can fool around with placement here so you have several uh, here but they're all compromises and again without going in and you know we'd probably spend 10 or 15 minutes uh, trying to place it so I'm just going to uh, do one or two just to show you what you can do. So I've got a boundary placement and that puts it uh, right along the boundary of the segment, which isn't ideal. Uh, you, we really want the segment to show up in the center. So let's uh, back to regular placement and that puts it in the center, but we still don't get our uh, uh, segment uh, three there. So you can just try uh, variations here. So we've got it straight in polygon and notice your other variations here. You can try horizontal positions first and that actually works pretty well. And then the important one here is may place label outside polygon boundary. And so when you have a small polygon, you can actually put it outside. And so that actually works. Uh, so we'll go with that for the moment. But again, uh, graphics or annotations uh, uh, may make your life easier here. And uh, the Labels are kind of close in here, uh, so they're covering up uh, when you have it at a certain zoom level. But again, uh, let's just let's just print this puppy. And uh, so, so I'm going to show you two ways of, of doing uh, printing a map. Uh, the first is just printing the map pretty much as you see it. Uh, we'll get the scale and do the layout. Uh, the second way is uh, pretty interesting in that we can actually uh, print based on each segment. And in ArcGIS 10, uh, that was called data-driven pages. So it allows you to choose a particular field and print according to that field. And so the map can be centered on that, on that field, in this case, the segment polygon, and uh, create a series of pages uh, that are they're centered on whatever uh, field you choose and so you can make that's how we made the map book uh, for the Grand Canyon uh, River and that's uh, how we can make team maps that show each team's individual assignment their segment assignment and they get a map uh, customized to their particular search area and so that was one of the great uh, features that ARC added that uh, really makes a whole bunch of uh, uh, map types uh, possible and really fast. And uh, just looking at the time here, I think we're coming up on 40 minutes of uh, YouTube video here, which is getting a little long. So sorry to say, we're going to do one more video of each of those uh, printing techniques. And, and the only one I'll want for those of you actually doing the map is the single map of the whole area. But I want you guys to see how a map series is done because uh, that, that's definitely going to be a useful uh, tool to know about uh, when uh, when you either work in incident mapping or in any kind of uh, mapping where you want to put together a series of uh, maps for, uh, uh, for whoever you're working for. Okay, so that'll do it for video four and uh, onward to video five, printing and finishing up. Thanks.